introduction. I didn't hear many screams or yells as when he said that I'm a Lakers fan. Come on, guys. I've been, I've been, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I've been pretty depressed because uh, Lakers basketball has been pretty bad the past few years. But I'm excited about what they're doing. I'm excited about what God is doing here at this conference. I'm here with my wife and my little baby girl, Ava. She's three months. Um, this morning, she, she couldn't stop praising the Lord. I, I'm just joking. Because she's, she t- I mean, she, just, she, was, she couldn't stop talking. So, ah, 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 ah. You know, I'm like, maybe she knows something about this conference. Maybe, maybe she's excited about this conference just as much as you all. You know, 12 years ago, I sat in the same room as you, clueless of what the Christian life is all about. To me, then the gospel was, was, just, was, was just about Jesus loving me and that I needed to respond to that message. And brothers and sisters, that is a good start, but there's so much more to that. And, and I'm very encouraged to see this, this number of young people here at this conference. And my prayer is that um, you guys will understand this book of Colossians and the theme of the supremacy of Christ. And I've been given the task to open the first message in the book of Colossians, chapter 1 through, uh, verse 1 through 14. Now, it's very challenging, uh, as this is my first time here speaking, um, speaking right after our president of the Christian Missionary Alliance. So it's like, uh, yeah, you have a very old guy who's wise, who's walked with the Lord for so long, and then you have this young guy who, who, who doesn't have as much wisdom as this older guy. <laughs> And but good thing to have me going first because Jude Dow is probably the oldest of us, and he's going to be cleaning up everything and all the mistakes that we're we're preaching up here, right? No, <laughs> I hope not. But before we look into God's word uh, in Colossians here, uh, let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this morning. I pray that may your spirit be with us and give us discernment uh, with your word and your truth here, Lord. We we thank you so much, and may you use this time to glorify you. We're praying to ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke 18, verse 18 through 27, a ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witnesses. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad. For he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard. It is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, then who can be saved? Jesus said, these things that are impossible with people are possible with God. I think this portion of scripture, many of us are very familiar with it. But I think if we read through it quickly, we, 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 we may not capture the essence of what Jesus is emphasizing here. It's not the case that rich people are doomed for hell because poor people are doomed for hell as well. I think, I think one thing we have to see here, this, a main point that Jesus is saying here is that, young man, there is nothing that you can do to inherit eternal life. That's what he wanted. It is impossible, but, but, but that's why at the end of verse 22, he says, uh, to this rich young ruler, follow me. In verse 27, all things are possible with God. In other words, God is the one who saves. And some of you guys are here this, this week and you're thinking, well, can God really save me? Can God really save me? What can I do if, if that's the case? What can I do to receive this salvation? And I think there's something very, very important that the book of Colossians covers. So let me sh- share a brief background to the book of Colossians. And this book is one of the most profound New Testament books 
that presents Christ in such a glorious way. This is a letter. So in a letter, when you're, for example, a love letter that someone writes to you, we guys don't do that anymore, but or maybe a Facebook post, you don't start from the middle or jump to the end. You got to read that entire letter, letter from the beginning to end to really understand and grasp the fullness of that message. And that's why this week we are going to be finishing the book of Colossians. Paul is the author. He is very familiar with the uh, 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 Greek culture. He's very familiar with the uh, 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 Jewish culture. He's someone who we can call, who was a hypocrite. But he came to know Christ. And so he's dealing with an issue within um, the church here. Epaphras is concerned about the believers there. And he goes to see Paul, who is a prisoner. This is one of his prison epistles. And he's, he's, he's asking, he's sharing what's going on. And Paul's very concerned. And Paul writes his letter addressing a heresy, a, a false teaching that's circulating into the church and slowly trying to creep its way into the church. And Paul's concerned. And Paul is writing, he wrote this letter to refute this um, false teaching. There are, deni- uh, he is, there, there are denials within the false teaching of the humanity of Christ. Because they saw Jesus as a smaller form of God. As they reach out to Jesus, we're going to, yeah, Jesus is just, just another angel. But what we see here in the book of Colossians 1, chapter 2, uh, chapter 1, verse 22, is that Paul says that Jesus has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. They didn't believe Jesus, he couldn't be a man and God at the same time. But here Paul says, Jesus has reconciled us through his fleshly body, through death. There are people there who, who didn't believe that. Uh, also in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, uh, Paul says, In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So automatically this false teaching is circulating. They're telling these believers in Colossians, saying that Jesus isn't enough. He isn't supreme. There's a different way you can come to know God apart from Christ. So Paul writes this letter, and his desire in chapter 1, verse 28, is to present every man complete in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 3, so that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden, and in him, chapter 2, verse 10, you have been made complete. So Paul's really attacking and defending the supremacy of Christ and who Jesus is to this church. So at the heart of his letter, as he's writing this letter, in these chapters that we're going through this week, he wants to prove, he wants to remind that Jesus is supreme. And the first thing here in this text, um, let us read that together. Colossians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored for you in heaven And about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learn it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. One of the things I noticed here in these few verses is that The gospel is transformative. The gospel changes. And Paul here is giving a confirmation of two specific things. Paul gives confirmation as he addressed this letter to his readers who are the Colossians. And he calls them faithful, faithful saints. He praises them for the love they have for each other, which echoes... John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
I think you and I, we desire confirmation. Do I look good today? Do, do, you know, is this outfit appropriate today? Will I, do I have a chance of talking to him or her? We all look for, we desire confirmation. Here Paul is saying that these people here, although there is this heresy, this false teaching circulating, that they are faithful saints. Paul confirms them because they, they have the fruit of love. And in this verse, he goes on and says, they also hope in heaven. They have a desire, a genuine desire to believe in God. In verse 6, they also bear fruit. Not only does Paul give confirmation to the believers and the Colossians, he also gives confirmation to Epaphras, saying that he is their fellow bondservant who is a faithful servant of Christ. So he gives confirmation to the work of the people in Col- of the Colossians, and then he gives confirmation of Epaphras, who is a faithful bondservant of Christ as well. So I want you to understand this, that in this letter, Paul is endorsing the impact of the gospel in their lives. He says that what he is doing, right, is by God's will. He says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Because why is this endorsement here important in this opening of this letter? Because some other churches, he doesn't endorse them. Think of Galatians. He says, I can't believe you are so quickly discerned the gospel that's change you for a different gospel. So Paul is really endorsing, Paul is really giving confirmation, affirmation of the believers here in this church. Why is that important? Again, he says that he is doing this by God's will. How so? Well, when he met Jesus in Acts chapter 9, Jesus said he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Galatians chapter 1 verse 11. For I, have no, for I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. See, Paul didn't receive the gospel for man. The apostle didn't go and share the gospel with Paul. Paul himself met the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9, and Jesus has given him a specific message of his gospel to proclaim his gospel. So, by God's will, he is an apostle or one who is sent out. And then in this case, Paul is an instrument of the Lord sent out to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Again, why is this significant? Why is Paul's confirmation of the gospel change important? It is important because as Christ has impacted and changed Paul's life in Acts chapter 9, God has called Paul. Paul himself has impacted another person's life. Again, it's important because as Christ has impacted and changed Paul's life with this gospel message, the gospel message spoken from Paul about Christ has impacted and changed Epaphras. And that same message of the gospel spoken from Epaphras has impacted and changed the Colossians themselves. Now, I think you can call that transformation. Jesus to Paul to Epaphras to the Colossians. So if Paul is endorsing the believers there, he's saying that you guys have truly received the the true gospel because it's changing you. I affirm the change because I myself, Paul, have experienced that change and I endorse what's going on in, in, in your church. I recognize Epaphras, who's a fellow bond servant. I think the Colossian, um, the people here, the Colossians here, then you can see in the, later in the text, Paul has not seen them. Paul has given this gospel message to Epaphras, and he comes back to um, Colossae, and he shares the gospel with them. Paul also confirms. I think when you look in verse 6, just as in the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of truth. 
Paul also said that although that confirmation, I give you that confirmation, that affirmation that there has been change in your life, guess what? Other people are being transformed by it too, right? Just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing so also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. The glory of the gospel here is not that one person is being saved. Jesus isn't saving just you, but this God is moving through and people who are impacted by the gospel will be transformed. People's lives will be different. If Paul is alive today, would he say the same thing about you? Would he give that same confirmation that, you know what, God, God has... Your life has been changed. Your life has been impacted by the gospel. And I give confirmation to that. Would Paul have been able to say that? Would Paul be able to say that? Would your parents be able to affirm that the gospel has transformed your life? Some of us are probably serving as leaders. Some of us have probably proclaimed and got baptized in front of our church uh, at camp. Those who are signing up for baptism here. When you go back home, will, your, will you be impacted genuinely by the gospel? Will your parents look and say, you know what, this person has changed? What about your siblings? What about your, your brothers and sisters in Christ at church? What about your friends? What about your youth group leaders? What about your sponsors, your chaperones? What about your pastors, your youth pastors? Can they give that same confirmation and say, you know what? My youth member here, my brother here, my sister here has genuinely been impacted by the gospel. Because again, if we are receiving and understanding the gospel as Paul's experience, that Jesus has called him, there will be confirmation. I'm not saying that people's thoughts and, and opinions are the high of the highest value but i'm saying if you have been impacted by the gospel there is a change here and i think that's what paul's stressing here because the colossians have been changed they are bearing fruit paul endorses that these, con these conferences can be very high in energy because of the amount of people you look across this room there there's there are thousands two thousand of us here Yes, it is exciting, but at the same time, it cannot be artificial. You cannot be singing from the top of your lungs with your hands raised and then at the same time go back home to your local church and be silent during praise. Maybe not even standing, maybe just sitting in your seat. Too many times when our emotions are stirred and stirred in a personal way, we, be we become prone to think that whatever we are feeling must be genuine. It could be a silly as meeting a person while making eye contact, he or she smiles back at you here at this camp. Dude, although it seems predestined, you just made it awkward so he or she had a smile back. <laughs> Maybe it was a, this other gentleman or late girl behind. At, with, again, there's so many of us. You see, it's so silly sometimes. We get captured in our emotions. I'm not saying that emotions is wrong. I'm saying that do not be fooled. Do not be fooled because your passions, your emotions needs to be under the authority of Scripture. And I think this, this next few verses, Paul is essentially saying that. So let's read on. Verse 10. So that you walk and live in a manner worthy. I'm going to skip verse 9 and we'll come back to that. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. The gospel is transformative. It changes. But how does that change look like? How sh what do we use to measure that appropriate change of the gospel? In these next few verses, Paul is praying for the people praying for the Colossians, and he's specifically praying that they will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now, when Paul says walking, he isn't saying that it's a stroll in the park, that we have to walk. Walking means that you are living. A life that reflects the transformative, the change, the impact of the gospel. 
So Paul indicates three things in this verse here. And he's calling the Colossians. Although I give you guys confirmation, here are some things that you guys need to continuously do. One, they are to live in a way that pleases God. Two, they are to live a life that bears fruit. And three, they are to live a life of increasing knowledge in God. So again, please God, bear fruit, and increase in knowledge. Now Paul doesn't give the details of the first two, of, of, of how we should live in a way that pleases God, or how bearing fruit completely looks like. He does distinguish love and hope in there. But in chapters 3 and 4, he will um, expound more on how we should be living a life that pleases God. So what Paul is stressing here is the fact that the Colossians are to increase their knowledge in God. Remember, not only is Epaphras concerned about the health of the church, but the faithful believers are being surrounded by false teachings. How does a person battle false teachings before it bleeds into a person's mind? By increasing his or her knowledge. With right teaching, right? Pretty simple. And that's what Paul says here in verse 9. For this reason, also since the day we heard of it, we have ceased not to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Yes, we give you confirmation. But you know what? From that day when we found out from Epaphras, we haven't ceased, we haven't stopped praying for you guys so that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul is saying, I know, I understand. I affirm everything. I affirm the genuine gospel change in your life, just like the rest of the, the world who's being changed by the gospel. But my prayer is that you have to be filled with God's knowledge and to be filled is to be completely filled or continuously and totally controlled where our minds are about God's truth, God's knowledge. You are to be, in verse 10, increasing in the knowledge of God. You have to continuously have spiritual wisdom. And MacArthur defines spiritual wisdom as the ability to collect and concisely organize principles from Scripture. And you have to be understanding application of those principles that you understand and see from Scripture. Here's what Paul, I think, is saying about the Colossians. In order for you to walk, remember walking is not simply just walking, but living a life worthy of the Lord. If you're to walk in a manner, live a life worthy of the Lord, our life in reflection of the transformative work of the gospel, the gospel that changes, you have to live by God's words. What measures, how a person, what measures how a person should live? What instructions or commands should, should a person live by? In what ways or how does a person know that his or her life is pleasing to God and that he or she is bearing the proper fruits? It's the word of God. Brothers and sisters, we live in a culture that wants God and not his instructions, not his words, not his commands. More, specific, more specifically, we live in a culture where Self-proclaimed believers want to experience God, but can care less about the Bible or the Word of God. What does this lead to? This kind of belief leads to practice, a practice of seeking experiences apart from the Word of God. Which God has no desire for it because it does not please Him. It will not bear His fruits, nor does it honor Him. So yeah, you have all these great passions. You guys have been impacted by the gospel. But brothers of the faith, Paul is saying, if you have been impacted by the gospel, the life you live should be measured up under the authority of scripture or else it doesn't please God, right? You can't say, I love Jesus, I'll follow you. And then walk a different life apart from what God has called us to. The Colossians here have received a genuine gospel, but yet false teaching is circulating. And they're thinking, and Epaphras is concerned because he's thinking, could they leave and walk away from this gospel? 
could they get confused that they need to do other things just to save themselves? You cannot live a gospel transformative life, a life that has been changed by the gospel without the truth of his word filling and controlling your thoughts to be like his. The Bible is, is so important. I hear people say, hey, I want to experience God, but, well, what do you understand about this portion of Scripture? You know, when do you, how often do you study your Bible? Well, what experiences are you really seeking then, right? If it's not from affirmation from God's Word or command from God's Word, what, what experiences are you really seeking? And lastly, the gospel qualifies and delivers. I can still recall a near-death experience well, not necessarily a near-death experience, but I was terrified. When I was a student at Tacola Falls College, my roommate, Jay, who's currently the pastor of the Sacramento Mullen Lions Church, I think he's here in this room, had this brilliant idea of snorkeling to look for fishing lures that's been stuck under the rocks of a lake. That's a bad idea. But I was a college student. And plus, I, I just, he showed me how to fish. So I, I done lost all his lures in the lake, the dam, by the Tacoa Dam. Some of you guys, if, if you live in Tacoa, you would know. And so we went to the dollar store, got our little glasses and everything, got on our life jackets. And we, there's about five of us. I can't remember if Pastor John Lee was with us too, but we jumped into that river. I'm like, okay, we're really doing it. All right, let's go. And so Jay would go unstrap that life jacket. He'd jump into the water. Come up, oh, look what I found. And everyone's like, oh, shoot, that's so cool. I want to do the same thing too, you know. And so I was swimming. I was like, man, why? how come these guys are so fast? I didn't understand why they were so fast. And then I got really, really tired. And I was like, forget these guys. I'm going to swim back to shore. And, 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 and I, I didn't even tell them. I just said, okay, I'm going to go back. So I started swimming back. Swimming, swimming, and then I got really, really tired. Like, I couldn't go anymore. And then I say, okay, I'm, I'm close to shore, so I'm going to stand up. And as soon as I stood up, there was nothing. And I started, you know, going up and down the water. Like, I'm like, oh, my goodness. Is there, I was trying to say, help, help. I was so scared. I look at the guys. All the guys were just like this. Like, this is looking over. Like, what's going on with this dude? I'm like, help, help. And then one of my buddies, too, he's like, are you serious? And he's like, you can't drown. You have a life jacket on. <laughs> I've never been on, with, I've never worn a life jacket and, 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 and was in the water. I don't know how that was. I was literally swimming the whole time. They were just floating and pedaling. But I say this, I say this, that I was trying to do the work of the life jacket. What I needed was to allow it to carry me. And I, say, I make this simple illustration here in comparison of the gospel to my life jacket. The gospel is what saves and sometimes we forget that and find ourselves scrambling. Scrambling to find new alternatives to keep our passion for Christ, to remind us about loving others what loving others should look like when all along the gospel, that life jacket is there. And we belittle the work of Christ. And Paul is addressing here, Paul is saying in verse 11, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to his kingdom of the beloved son. In whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. First off, there are many principles working against us. Against the gospel. Against the atoning work of Christ. Romans 3.23 has said, we have all sinned. Romans 5 says that sin entered through one man's disobedience. Our nature is dark and following, fallen. And I say this to my youth group, my church, about my baby girl, Ava, who's three months. And I say she is a sinner. As cute as she is, her nature is to want to sin. Unless you just sleep throughout the night, right? Um, 
But, she, but we are fallen beings. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that, Paul says in, in that chapter, in, the, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Not only are we sinners by nature and desire, and all we know is just sin, there is a, 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 a person. There, is, there are demons, the God of this world, referring to not Jesus, but Satan himself, in his domain is blinding us, doing everything he can to blind us, to veil us from understanding the, the gospel. Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3, and you were dead, non-responsive, in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince, Satan again, to the power of the air, Satan's domain, his realm, of the spirit that is now now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in, our, in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Ephesians 2, 12. We were excluded, strangers to the covenant, to the promises of God. Colossians 1, 21, later on. Um, we are enemies, Romans 5, 10. We are enemies again. So now what Paul's describing here in his prayer is the original state of the Colossians. Before the gospel reached them through Epaphras, they live in this dark, dark world. This world that is just filled with sin. They didn't know any better. It's as if you were thrown in a dark room and you did not know where the light is at. A pitch dark room. And that's all you know until the light comes. This is good news as Epaphras comes and be, to become, to be that light. Which was preached by Paul is the atoning work of Christ that by faith in him, as we see through scriptures, that by faith in him, they will be rescued, verse 13, to be instantly removed or have an immediate change of location from the darkness, this pitch dark black room, and into the kingdom of Christ. Why? Verse 14, because God has forgiven them of their sins. And verse 12, God has qualified them for eternal life. Do you see where Paul is hinting here for the Colossians? Have they forgotten so easily the message that has transformed their hearts and their minds as these false teachings are circulating? Verse 11, Paul says that when you are walking, when you are living and bearing fruit, increasing in the knowledge of the word of God, the Holy Spirit will strengthen you and to be steadfast, to be firm, to be patient, to be joy joyful, to be thankful. You see, sometimes we, we, the gospel is like this life jacket that's there and we just forget about it. Because the work that, the transformational work that goes behind the scenes, we don't see. We don't necessarily see, but all these things, this transformation, that we were in the kingdom of darkness, of sin. We didn't know any better. We were, we, all we cared about was ourselves. We were going to go to hell. And yet Christ comes, this gospel, Christ comes and says, you know, this is the kingdom of light. In that, in there, you shall have life. And that when we are redeemed, when we place our faith, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, immediately, instantly, you are transferred, you are delivered from this darkness, this domain of Satan, into the kingdom of life, a kingdom of light. And that you and I not will be walking, right? Why do we live? Why do we walk? Why do we live in a manner worthy of the Lord? It's not because that makes us, that saves us. We are already transferred from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. We are living because we're in a kingdom. We no longer walk accordingly to the ways of the world because we are in this kingdom. We know of no darkness. We are not part of that anymore. And because we're in the kingdom, the king gives orders and commands. The Bible instructs us how we should walk, how we should live in this kingdom of light. Because without that instruction, without scripture, we're going to fall right back into the kingdom of darkness. We're going to walk that path because that's all we know. So the transformative work of the gospel, when the gospel came, it impacts, it changes people. It changes the Colossians. 
It changes you and changes me, and it can change you if you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. I think a question that we may all have and have asked ourselves as we wrap up here in the past, what, what can I do to inherit this kingdom? What can I do to qualify myself? Paul says here in verse 12, God qualifies. Why is Christ supreme? It's not your work. It's not what you're, you, you can do. The rich young ruler, if he were to win and sell all his belongings, that's not going to save him. The impossible of being in the domain of Satan in the darkness to become possible is only through Jesus Christ. And if you're thinking, what can I do this week as we go through this book of Colossians to, to detail and to talk about the supremacy, to talk about Jesus Christ, and I want you guys to ask yourself, if you have not accepted Christ, do I want to be a part of this kingdom? And if I do, you, I will have to place my faith in Jesus. And for some of us, if we say, yeah, the gospel has changed us, we believe the gospel. Is it bearing fruit? Is it changing you? And I believe once we hit chapters 3 and 4, we will know more of how we should be walking. Does the, the Bible, does God's word ring relevancy into your hearts, into your thinking? Does God's word change and control the way you think about different situations, whether shootings, whether uh, funerals, whether it's a wedding or celebration, the gospel? God's word changes the way we think. We must live and walk in a manner worthy of the Lord based upon his truth because we are in the kingdom of life. We are no longer in the kingdom of darkness whose domain is filled with corruption and sin. Because, we, because of this, we too have been changed by the transformative work of the gospel like the Colossians, like Epaphras, like Paul who received this message from Jesus who, is, who, who, we, who we have read in, our, in the gospels. Christ is supreme because of his work is supreme. The gospel is gloryful because it is a work that God has done in Christ, bearing that image, which glorifies God. God is pleased with that and also opens the, the opportunity for us to be a part of this kingdom. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and uh, Pastor McYoung has an announcement before we head out to workshops. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning, Lord. I know there's a lot of information in these 14 verses, Lord, but I pray that may you be with us as we go back home, that may your spirit continue to nudge our hearts to see your truth um, based upon your word, Lord. I pray that may you allow us to evaluate ourselves, Lord, if we truly say the gospel has impacted us, it has it changed us. And if it has changed us, are the changes being determined and accepted under the authority of Scripture? And if it changes us accordingly to the, uh, the authority of Scripture, we will be walking and living a life that reflects that. And we will be embracing daily the fact that we have, are no longer in the kingdom of darkness, but we are in the kingdom of light. We are your children. You are giving us command as a king. And we are to submit and to listen and to follow. I pray that may this be upon our hearts this morning. I pray that may you be with all those who have not accepted you. I pray that may you work in our hearts to allow us to think to challenge us that, Lord, if there should there be a way, and, Lord, you've made a way that's possible to be with you, Lord. So I pray and ask that may you bless this group as we head out through this week. May you continue to speak to us. I pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name.